it's a terrific pleasure to welcome a, a very old friend, uh, often a colleague, and one of the more useful people uh, in the world, uh, Wolfgang Schleich. As you know from his bio, Wolfgang got his equivalent to the PhD uh, at the University of Bielefeld. I first met him, uh, I think, in 86 or so, before I was at Wisconsin, before I'd gotten really the offer to come to Wisconsin, when I was at the University of Miami. And I sought him out because I was just so impressed by his writings in industrial relations. And I found him at the Wissenschaftszentrum in Berlin, uh, uh, which is... Uh, it's it's uh, changed its building, but I guess not its address since I saw him there. But um, I remember we struck up uh, an almost immediate warm uh, friendship. Uh, and then I was really delighted after coming to Madison that he, in the meantime, had negotiated a, an appointment here. And and so that was the best of all worlds. So he arrived here and, and he was here from 88 to 95, after which he went off you know, as was a, entirely appropriate and responsible to do, given the situation, German politics at that time, uh, to try to help out his motherland. And uh, and he was right. He ran the uh, Max Planck Institute in Starnberg for, for several years. But wh while he was here, Wolfgang was the guy I started cows with. And we would joke at that time, there was uh, um, the Berkeley Roundtable on the international economy or Brie. And we said, well, okay, yeah, Brie's fine, but let's get even more basic in terms of the of the political and social infrastructure you need for a decent economy. So let's call our thing cows. Uh, we made up that ridiculous story after we made up, or I made up the name uh, out of the blue in a conversation with Bob Haverman. Anyway, Cows's name, as some of you know, is going to change in January to the High Road Strategy Center, which is what we've been pushing, Wolfgang and I, and then me alone, me and Laura, and all the crowd at, uh, at that institute ever since. Um, but back to Wolfgang. So he, he's been incredibly productive. Um, uh, books include Democracy at Work, uh, um, Contract Status, Post-Industrial Justice, Relatively New, um, 22, how Will Capitalism End? Essays on a Failing System, Verso 2016, The Delayed Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, uh, 2014, and Reforming Capitalism, in Institutional Change in the German Political Economy. And we originally invited Wolfgang to talk this fall about some of that stuff and the future of uh, democratic uh, uh, and other forms of capitalism and trying to see our way toward a better future. And he was agreed to do that, but then uh, increasing um, personal concern with and agitation around and involvement in trying to work out a, a more sensible solution to uh, the first ground war uh, in Europe since the Second World War. Uh, uh, first delayed him in being able to do that. First, he said, I really can't do it. I'm just too preoccupied with Ukraine. Uh, and then we said, well, you know, we'll then talk about Ukraine. And then he said, okay, I can talk about Ukraine, but what I really want to talk about is the insanity of geopolitics. And, and we said, great, talk about the insanity of current geopolitics, U.S.-dominated geopolitics. And, uh, and so that's what you have before you today, as soon as I stop talking, which I hope to do real soon. But in the spring, he's going to come back uh, with the original um, uh, or a version of the original talk. So if you don't get enough of Volkong today, uh, he'll be back in the spring. In the meantime, let me just uh, send you kisses, Volkong. Welcome to Madison again by remote. Take it away. War is not exactly what I have been working on for during my life. But um, a few years ago, on the 200th anniversary of uh, Friedrich Engels, I was asked to uh, give one of the opening lectures. And rather than trying to repeat what has always been said about him, like uh, this sort of uh, genius, but not quite uh, the genius of his uh, friend and collaborator, uh, Fritz, um, Karl Marx, uh, I, I looked at his work on war, 
and on the relationship between uh, the technology of arms and the, uh, uh, the, the, the growth of the state as the monopoly owner uh, of the means of violence, which in this essay I, I then call the means of destruction uh, to distinguish them from the means of production and, and put these uh, in a relationship uh, with each other. Uh, reading this, I uh, reading Engels, I uh, I hit on this uh, uh, absolute devastating uh, prediction he made uh, shortly before the end of his life in the in the eighteen uh, late eighteen seventies, namely that the way the way the world was developing, it was to be expected that at some stage, not not so far away, there would be a global war with about 15 million dead. That's he wrote. That's what he wrote in, an, in a letter to a friend, deeply depressed. Um, he, he sort of uh, rescued the point by, by, uh, by saying that after, after the war, however, the proletariat will get rid in all countries of these uh, scoundrels who, who had uh, uh, involved them in, in, this, uh, in this madness. And as a result, we will be a step further to the socialist revolution. And anyway, the First World War was coming, and it was only uh, a little more than 40 years. Uh, and the number was basically was basically not wrong. So, so this relationship between or, or, the, or the significance, the historical significance of the evolution of the means of, uh, of destruction is something that in the last two years began to become uh, uh, clear to me how important uh, this uh, uh, Engels' uh, uh, insight uh, on, on this dynamic was. In the article I wrote about it, in the lecture, I, I argued that uh, uh, what he had discovered was a second line uh, of uh, social uh, evolution, uh, namely, uh, in addition to the evolution of the means of production, the means of uh, of the uh, uh, destruction had a had a weight of their own. They they were not dependent. There there were at least two different uh, strands of, of of cultural development that uh, hit on each other, reinforced each other, sometimes uh, stood in conflict with each other, and so on. So. The last two years, of course, I, I had to read about this war in Ukraine and now about this war in Palestine and and also about uh, the, the the new world order of George Bush Senior and and what became of it. There's enormously interesting uh, literature around, which someone like like me who who, who had looked on uh, domestic class struggles was hadn't really been aware. Of. What I will uh, do today is I will, uh, under the, uh, I, I will talk about the irresponsibility of bystanders. Bystanders uh, in this uh, context are nations that uh, uh, let, uh, uh, that, that let the, the, the origins of war foster, evolve, go on without doing anything about it, and thereby uh, uh, break. Uh, all the uh, uh, all the duties that they have taken on under the Charter of the United Nations. So you will hear something on this, uh, be, because if you venture in this field, uh, the, the little normativity that there is is becoming so valuable that you are actually forced to uh, to to take a close look. And there were some surprises there. I, I begin with what I call a fundamental global asymmetry in the world of, in, in the international system, uh, which, um, on which I follow uh, by saying that uh, the United Nations regime is basically uh, preempted by this uh, asymmetry in a very particular way. Then, then I say something on how this is engineered, so to speak, at the level of these mid-sized or smaller nations, 
by war propaganda, and I will uh, uh, spell out four or five of the main topics of the public discourse that uh, results in this uh, in this uh, uh, irresponsibility. Then I will say something on Ukraine, uh, followed by a short remark on Palestine, and then followed by uh, an, an American. Uh, remark, which is un-American in the following sense. There are uh, tragic histories that uh, cannot easily be uh, redressed. Uh, and and the hope that there is a solution to everything, if you are only optimistic and, and creative either, uh, may actually in these fields absolutely not uh, come true. And then maybe a few words of what can realistically happen in these in these places. Uh, the asymmetry essentially has something to do with the absolutely huge size of the United States and, and a few sort of um, uh, geopolitical uh, advantages that this country has that are very rarely mentioned in, in, the, in the literature in the sense that we always talk about states and small states, but here's something that is, that is fundamentally uh, sort of categorically a, a different uh, uh, place. Uh, here I, I have just to just to give you a basic uh, idea. I have I have uh, uh, charted the uh, arms spending of three nations, beginning with the end of the Cold War. Uh, this is here, 1990, uh, and and then you have something like the so-called peace dividend, which ends, however, at the end of the 1990s. Then it sort of remains flat. And from the George Bush war on terror period, there's this absolutely unprecedented in the history of the world, unprecedented increase in, in military spending in constant terms, which in uh, uh, two, two, 2010, at the beginning of the Obama, in the first Obama administration, uh, reaches one and a half times as much uh, as uh, uh, at the high point of the Cold War. Uh, so here we have the, then there's sort of a decline, but but uh, interestingly in the in the years of Trump, uh, it is increasing and it keeps increasing. At this point in time, uh, Russia, the Russian uh, spending was uh, sort of absolutely completely negligent uh, compared to the American. Uh, America had at this time uh, 750 foreign bases. Uh, uh, Russia, I think, had about five, five or six. The Chinese didn't. Have, the Chinese yeah. are interesting. In at the beginning of the 1990s, like, like Russia, they were absolutely not not existent in this in this game. But now they have this very, very, very uh, uh, constant uh, rise. Whereas, whereas the um, uh, Russia is spending about one third of the aggregate spending of Germany, France, and the United Kingdom. In, in other words, uh, and Germany almost, and I mean, even without with its low spending that was always com complained about by the United States, uh, spends uh, uh, almost as much as Russia. Now, all, there's all this fake in these things, but, but you cannot, uh, uh, but but this, these are dimensions that uh, uh, cannot easily be. Uh, then, um, very interesting further effect is, in, in spite of all the money, or maybe as a result of it, the United States have almost no military deaths compared to, to other countries. In the Spanish American and Philippine American War, it was 6,600 people that died. Mm -hmm. World War I, 116,000. Uh, in, in Russia alone, it was, uh, I think, 35 million. Uh, no, no, sorry, here we are. This was, I go back. Uh, uh, this was 35 million Russians. The Korean so, War, a little more. The Vietnam War, in 20 years, 58,000. 
which was roughly the number of people that died in traffic accidents in the United States in one year uh, in the 1960s. Gulf War, almost nobody. The war in Afghanistan, which also lasted 20 years. Um, here you go. Iraq war, almost one. Syria, just, just to take one of these things, operation in here and resolve 113 people. Now, now the result of this is, of course, that, that you um, can basically do what you want. You, you can lose a war, uh, but when it doesn't hurt you, and there's, there's nothing. And then, then I, I did some sort of computation and, and looked at kill ratios. Uh, the, um, in, 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 in the Vietnam War, you had about 1.7 or 3.3 .3 million dead. To kind of recount them uh, because of the way they were killed. But for one American dead, between 30 and 50 cents. The Persian Gulf was, was uh, uh, even, even, even more. Uh, then comes uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, there were private American contractors, which you could include then, then the, the racial uh, declines. Uh, but in Iraq, for example, it goes, it goes up and in Syria, uh, well, one to eight hundred five. So wait, yeah. Let me, let me go back here. Now, what what does that mean? Um, basically, I think uh, you live in a world here where you can uh, go on, uh, onto a war without uh, having to consider uh, uh, your uh, national. Uh, uh, your national uh, uh, dead. Uh, more interesting is the geographical part. Um, the, it, it, it struck me only after after reading this stuff for a while. Imagine that uh, the United States is one big continent. It has it has two borders. Uh, one is Canada, uh, the other is Mexico. They are in both countries, so to speak, already very, very nicely, very nicely established. Uh, so, so they, they, don't, they, they don't face a hostile border. In fact, uh, it is totally inconceivable that a foreign country could uh, sort of march into onto the territory of the United States, which is a permanent fear of the Russians that that uh, that, that they would be invaded. Uh, just for, just for the fun of it, Im imagine that the Iraqi army would sort of uh, uh, cruise into Chesapeake Bay and uh, occupy Washington and and demand uh, the uh, extradition of uh, George Bush the second to stand trial before the uh, International Criminal Court in in in, in the Hague. Completely, absolutely unthinkable. Uh, simply because of the ge geographic situation. And uh, that, in my view, results in this typical pattern, it explains this typical pattern of, of United States uh, foreign policy since at least 1990, namely to embark on uh, uh, projects uh, that, uh, that are chosen uh, with a sort of leisure, uh, uh, attitude. Yeah, let's just have a war here. You know, we we can lose it, but it doesn't it doesn't hurt us. Yeah, the Iraq War wasn't won, the Afghanistan War wasn't won, but uh, very very few uh, traces in the uh, in in the uh, uh, on on the domestic front. It's uh, yeah. Um, so uh, then. Uh, recklessness, adventurism, brinkmanship, um, and the, uh, the the unpredictable, uh, the unpredictable uh, ending of of these things. So now we hear uh, that uh, the Biden administration is about to draw uh, to to move out of the Ukrainian conflict and leave it to the Europeans to clean the mess up. They can do this; it doesn't hurt them. Uh, there's there's no. Uh, no responsibility for what they do, 
uh, it was a proxy war, then they go out. It's no longer a proxy war. It's a war that uh, the European Union is supposed to to fight with, with its completely uh, uh, sort of insufficient needs. Others delegate responsibility to the one superpower instead of staying away from it. In spite of disasters like Iraq, Syria, Libya, always afraid of being left alone in the absence of effective diplomatic machinery. Uh, and and I, I would say the reason why there is no such machinery is simply this hugeness, this absolutely giant, giant dimension of the United States and, and the way it can engage in, in things unpunished and unpunished. Uh, there is no way of punishing them for, for these. Um, yeah, second, uh, now then uh, you, you see that we're actually uh, living in a situation in which peace has become a, a, a Pax Americana in a way that uh, uh, is uh, uh, d d d that you think could not exist. Uh, let me go to uh, I don't know. Let me go to yeah, uh, the, the, if, if you look at the UN Charter, to maintain international peace and security, to take collective action for the prevention and removal of threats and the suppression of acts of aggression or other breaches of the peace, and to bring about by peaceful means and in conformity adjustment or settlement of international dispute. You, you see, I, I, I had never read this. Out of this, you find that uh, international law presupposes and is based on the assumption of collective responsibility for the prevention of wars, not just one, all of them. All members shall settle their international disputes by peaceful means in a matter that international peace and security and justice are not in danger. And, and very importantly, uh, the parties to any dispute the continuance of which is likely to endanger the maintenance of international peace and security, shall first of all seek a solution by negotiations, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, arbitration, judicial settlement, resort to regional agencies or arrangements or other peaceful means of their own choice. That's Article 33. In a world that is so much divided in, 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 terms, of, in terms of military power, that is extremely unlikely that the, the big uh, uh, country will go through all these things if they know they can do it on their own. I, I quote uh, a fascinating article by a former uh, official uh, of the, of the uh, uh, United Nations. I have to move this away from me. Yeah. In uh, many ways, the UN Charter is far superior to today's black and white view of the world between good and good. For example, the UN Charter does not use terms such as war of aggression, preventive war, anti-terrorism, or even humanitarian. It does not distinct differentiate between the respective political systems of the member states or between justified and unjustified points of contention between the parties to the conflict. The UN Charter assumes that there are always two sides to every conflict, which must be reconciled by peaceful means. Applied to the Ukraine war, Russia's and Ukraine's security interests would have been equal and should have been resolved through negotiation. And uh, Schulenburg is, is a relative of the German ambassador to, uh, to the Soviet Union, uh, before the uh, outbreak of the Second World War, who was uh, then uh, uh, executed by Hitler uh, because a few days before the Germans uh, uh, went into Russia, he went to Stalin and told him that uh, the Germans are going to attack him and that he had to absolutely do something to, to prevent this from happening. But he didn't believe him. He thought it was a trap. I, I, I read from, from the UN Charter this, this other uh, 
oder vom, vom, vom Schulenbuch. Die Menschheit ist a mutual obligation of all member states to resolve conflicts peacefully. The general ban on the use of military force for political purposes is based on this alone and not the other way around. The UN Charter is not a global ceasefire agreement, but a call to all member states to guarantee global peace by peaceful means. The Charter is first and foremost a commandment for peace and only then a ban on war. And, and uh, I, I think this is a normative aspect of a stable uh, international system that is completely forgotten in the in the public in the public debate. So no, so back. And we go out here. Yeah. Let me let me add something of the structure of the international system. When when I said it was a Pax Americana, you can really think it is in many ways identical. Uh, with what the Romans thought was Pax Romana. The Pax Romana was not peace between different countries. The Romans never made a peace treaty, except with countries that had, uh, uh, that had, uh, how do you say, subjugated themselves to Roman rule. Uh, the, the, uh, even the suggestion of diplomacy was ridiculed by the, by the Roman Senate from the beginning. There was never a talk on, on compromise, always a talk on, uh, on conquest. And uh, never diplomacy. The, uh, and it is interesting to, uh, to read uh, a little bit about this famous uh, uh, Roman or uh, Latin uh, uh, saying, si vis pacem, para bellum, which uh, is usually uh, translated. If you want peace, you have to you have to prepare for war. Uh, in to today, it is meant and it is understood to mean that you have to have lots of uh, military equipment in uh, as deterrence. No, for the Romans, parabellum means peace was available only after the conquest, not before the conquest. If you want peace, you have to prepare for war, but prepare to go to war, <laughs> and then and that would be then uh, peace and only that. I I just to just want to say how uh, how interestingly this uh, uh, both the interaction of strategy and normative rules uh, uh, looks. I and I now want to say something on especially Germany, uh, which I can uh, sort of. Uh, uh, observe from uh, close up, and and if you if you look at how uh, this country that uh, up to uh, let's say two years ago was basically seen by by myself too, is still obsessed with uh, a post uh, post war uh, sort of quasi pacifist uh, uh, mood. If you see how uh, how fast. Uh, uh, how, how little time it took to completely, completely uh, uh, wipe this out and, and for especially the Green Party to become a very, very tough uh, sort of friend of, uh, of military, of the Roman kind of peace, if you want. Diplomacy has become a dirty word. It, it means submission. If the few remaining leftists in the country suggest that the Ukrainian war should be settled by diplomacy, they are being ridiculed. Uh, you cannot have, uh, it, it is not possible. You have to win the war first, then there is diplomacy. Uh, the, one of the concepts that, that are sort of very frequently used is the German word verstehen, understanding. Uh, there is no understanding. Nowhere to understand an enemy. Uh, if you if you uh, uh, suggest that a war is a, a sort of mutual interactive process, uh, you you you're being called a Putin versteher, someone who understands Putin. Where understand means uh, to uh, to approve. Of. Yeah, uh, 
I, 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 I keep saying that sociology is, a, according to Max Weber, an understanding, an interpretive, interpretive science, as he was, verstehen the Wissenschaft. We can't, we can't uh, go without it. But, but here, yeah. this has become, this has become absolutely almost a treason. Relativization is a word that comes up all the time. Uh, if you put something in a context, let's say the attack of Russia on 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 Ukraine or the uh, the Hamas attack on uh, on on these on these kibbutzes, and and argue that this is part of a longer story, uh, that is you uh, you relativize. Uh, now you can, you can say. Uh, all thinking is relativizing something. You cannot, uh, uh, you can't understand anything without putting it in a, in a context with with something else. Um, enemy behavior is no prehistory. Exploring prehistory means support for staying trees. De Decontextualization is the story of the day. Civilization versus barbarism. Very uh, in in every day you you read the newspaper there are barbarians. Barbarians, and among the Greeks, were people who, who you couldn't speak to because they spoke these, they, 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 they uttered these strange noises, blah, 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 blah. They, they were not even really human beings. So there wasn't any way of, uh, of, of arguing with them. Uh, you had to slaughter them. Uh, all of this is framed in a, in, in, in a way in which the old German. Uh, Proto-fascist Carl Schmidt uh, in in the uh, in his book on the on the political uh, is is encountered daily in German newspapers and uh, and mass media, which is that the enemy is an existential enemy, not just an enemy. An existential enemy in in the terms of Carl Schmidt is someone with whom you cannot live. There is no way of 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 peace with an existential, with other enemies like Fudge. Smith, for example, says it's absolutely ridiculous to send young young men in, in, in battle for, for some sort of piece of land to belong to that state rather than the other state. Uh, th that is not just ridiculous, it is frivolous. Uh, going to war is only possible where the enemy is an existential enemy. The enemy is one who cannot live with you, and you cannot live uh, with the enemy, so one of you had to die. That's of the core of a fascist idea of, of, uh, of warfare. Absolutely, completely uh, contradictory to what the 1946 uh, uh, Charter of the United Nations uh, that I have quoted. Absolutely the opposite of it. So, um, yeah. I have a few more minutes, and uh, uh, what what I want to say is uh, just to to engage in some sort of understanding. Uh, just this here. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, as far as uh, uh, the Ukrainian war is concerned. This map shows here the, the Iron Curtain after uh, 1949. On this side was the Western Europe. On this side, uh, either uh, the Communist bloc or uh, parts of Russia, or of the Soviet Union. Um, Lenin was on this side, it is sort of special status, but, but Germany, one half of Germany or one third of Germany was part of, of the Eastern part of Europe. The, the, uh, the zone uh, that uh, Russia, Moscow, considered its, uh, its cordon uh, sanitaire. Uh, after 1991, after 1990, uh, these countries uh, sort of broke out or were released from uh, the uh, uh, the Soviet bloc, they include Slovakia, uh, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia. Sort of was, as you remember, uh, co contested between 
uh, the West and the East, uh, and is now in sort of an intermediate stage. Uh, the, the, the German uh, government is being told by the by the Americans that all of these countries have to be uh, included in the European Union. Um, and then that was that, and then these countries uh, sort of became uh, former Soviet republics, at least since 1918, became members of NATO under permanent protests of Moscow. Belarus is sort of in, the, in an intermediate position, and this is Ukraine. Huge, huge, and the Ukrainian border to Moscow is about 500 miles. Uh, you, throughout the 1990s, uh, the, uh, the Russians, in the, in, well into the 2000s, under Yeltsin, as well as Putin, kept saying <laughs> that uh, uh, Ukraine cannot be a uh, NATO member if NATO insists that w whatever state is a member of NATO, uh, NATO can put up any uh, military infrastructure, any military means they want. The, the, the slogan, not one inch, was actually about, we are not going, going to talk about any sort of small part of these countries that become NATO members, uh, and where we would make a commitment not to put up sort of uh, missiles of this and that sort. Uh, it is interesting that now, now looking here at France, uh, Germany, uh, Britain, they all knew, they had heard it, they all knew that this was the Casus Belli. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, 2008, uh, and the French president and the German chancellor vetoed uh, the uh, invitation of uh, Ukraine to, uh, uh, to, to join NATO. Uh, George Bush was angry at them, but he was going out. Um, there was no, there, everybody knew it. Nobody did anything about it. Uh, they said it happened, hoping, hoping in this sort of brinkmanship that something would. Uh, happened that would make the obvious uh, uh, not, uh, not, 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 not happen. I'm, uh, I, I want to not, not go on forever. Uh, Israel is a similar thing. Um, since the murder of, uh, of Rabin, uh, it was clear that the Oslo agreement was not going to happen. Uh, during that time, uh, Israel became uh, uh, unbelievably uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, invested in, in, in arms. They now have 90 nuclear, 90 nuclear warheads, uh, five submarines, four of them uh, in Germ produced in Germany, where the assumption is that they are capable of uh, firing nuclear uh, nuclear missiles, uh, 1,250 rocket launchers, 56,000 armored vehicles, 2,200 battle tanks, fighter planes, 241, and troops uh, galore. Yeah, there must have been this assumption that whatever you do, nothing can happen to you. Um, in 2008-2009, this was uh, sort of tried out in this uh, Operation Castanet. The kill ratio was uh, 1 to uh, 231 or 255, whatever you want. If you include the three civilians that, that, that also died on the on, on the Israeli side, six military, three civilians, 1,391 Palestinians. And and if you can trust uh, your arms that it that they can produce this sort of outcome, there's very little incentive uh, to uh, to negotiate. In in fact, um, we can we, we can talk about this a little later. Uh, in fact, I thought that a good metaphor for the way in which uh, Gaza was was handled 
was the uh, the Alan Greenspan doctrine of, of counterinsurgency. You remember Alan Greenspan, who, who told us that uh, um, they knew that there would be uh, financial crises. Uh, they thought, however, that by doing something to prevent them, they might cause all sorts of damage and incur all sorts of losses. And it wasn't necessary to prevent them because now they knew, however, uh, how they could uh, clean up after. Uh, that, that was basically basically the, the, the idea. And, and now if you go a little forward then, and you see at the economy of Gaza, before and after the closures, the closures being 16 years ago, 2006, when Gaza was sort of closed by the Israelis. And this is, this is unattended data. Uh, and now you have, you have enormous population growth. Population density is is unbearably high. The real GDP uh, is almost constant. Uh, the uh, real real GDP per, per capita uh, goes down by one fifth. Uh, the uh, the share of Gaza and Palestinian GDP, that is Gaza and the West Bank, goes down from thirty one percent to. Fourteen uh, percent to 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 seventeen percent. Gaza investment and share of Palestinian GDP uh, nine point five going down to one point nine. Labor force, however, of course, increases. The difference was three hundred uh, uh, three hundred thousand uh, unemployed workers uh, are now almost uh, one and a half times as many as before. And the unemployment rate is by 45 is at 45 percent, uh, where 65 percent of the population now uh, receive uh, uh, subsidies from uh, from the United Nations in order to survive. This thing goes basically continues. The, the decline is basically a continuous process. When I read this, I wondered how long uh, our governments visiting visiting Israel. Talking to the leaders, nobody ever talking about Germany and Europe was willing to see to have himself photographed in front of the wall around Gaza. That was too touchy. Their secret services must have told them what was going on there. Never, never did they, uh, 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 never did they say even only a word about it. In the assumption that somehow, at least as long as they were in office, this process could continue that way without exploding, uh, totally assuming that people that were locked in there would not uh, try to get out. Stop here and leave the rest to the discussion. Maybe, maybe I can, maybe before I stop, I, I would say, uh, if we are asked to make a constructive uh, suggestion as to what uh, uh, shall be done, then in both cases, but especially in the Palestinian case, you you feel that this is an this is an unanswerable question. Uh, the, the big mistakes have been made uh, 20, 30 years ago. I, I would say when uh, when Israel after the uh, assassination of Rabin, uh, dropped out of the Oslo process, uh, de decided to promote the settlements on, on the West Bank. Now 700,000 people, uh, West Bank and, and East uh, uh, Jerusalem, uh, cut the uh, population of, uh, of uh, Palestine, the Arab population, into two halves, one governed by Hamas, the other and then governed by, uh, by the uh, Arafat faction. Uh, you don't do such things uh, without uh, being punished for it. Uh, they foreclose uh, possibilities uh, of uh, coming to some sort of solution, and maybe they are designed to actually do that. 
and then another, another generation inherits this, and they simply don't know what to do. Uh, so this is the un un -American, uh, un American perspective on uh, uh, long uh, processes that get locked into themselves and uh, where the optimism of, of the will uh, has to give uh, way uh, to uh, the pessimism of the mind. And I look forward to, I, I look forward to our discussion. Um, and thanks to Wolfgang uh, for a really interesting presentation. I've got a couple of questions. One's quite straightforward and maybe you know this, maybe you don't, uh, Wolfgang. Sorry, I'm David Jameson, by the way, editor of Contra.Score. Um, the first is just about um, the situation in Palestine. Um, you noted in your slides there, you know, in Operation Cast Lead in 2009, only six Israeli soldiers were killed, a much higher proportion of Hamas fighters. And it's quite widely accepted now that 2009 was a military disaster for Hamas. The situation is clearly very different today. And I just don't, I, I was just wondering if you knew why that might be what's changed in Gaza. I think these things are obscure to many of us. Um, they're naturally obscure because of the nature of Gaza uh, as this kind of open air prison camp. We don't know what's going on there. Hamas is an underground military and so on. Um, but just what might have changed in the balance of forces there. On a much more general point, um, I think it was really interesting what you said about um, the kind of presentism of war propaganda now. There's a huge resistance to contextualization. Perhaps in some senses that's always been true. I dare say if you go back to the yeah. Vietnam War, you know, the American public had information withheld from them about the nature of um, European colonialism in, in Asia, the Vietnamese long fight for independence and so on. So it's, you know, there's always a, a struggle against context in war. I do think there's something quite different about the present period, and you alluded to it, which is the extreme nature of it. The thing that's apparent to me, for example, in the case of Ukraine is ruling elites in the West can't stop vindicating the Nazis. I just find it the strangest thing in the world. On the one hand, we're told that all our enemies are a new Hitler. And on the other hand, Hitler wasn't quite so bad. I mean, we've had the SS celebrated in the Canadian Parliament. I mean, these things would be ludicrous if they just, you could write them off as, a, as an eccentricity if they didn't keep happening. In British journalism, there's no routine articles written saying Hamas are worse than the Nazis, because at least the Nazis were so ashamed of their crimes that they tried to conceal them. These are arguments that would have been unthinkable even two or three years ago. They're very close to sort of the arguments of Holocaust revisionism, Third Reich revisionism, no. and yet really mix with um, this constant refrain that all of our enemies are a new Hitler. It's a very strange kind of postmodern intellectual environment where we're constantly being told there's no past, there's no context, evil is everywhere, and yet evil is instantly vindicated yeah. in the next yeah. in the next. And so I, I wanted to ask if you thought that in some way this was rooted in elite sociology, because... I think a lot of people make the point that our politicians themselves seem very ignorant of history, incapable of constructing a coherent narrative about how the, the past leads to the present. Has something changed at that level? This seems to be something more than just war propaganda going on here. Yeah, this is this is an absolutely fascinating subject. How the Nazis and and the Second World War are constantly pulled out of uh, out out of the historical memory and selectively applied to all sorts of to all sorts of events and uh, in, in, par in part uh, for this what what you what what is part of of standard uh, um, war propaganda which is the demonization of the of the opponent yeah uh, if uh, Putin is a new Hitler, uh, then, then there's no need to think about the collective origins of that war. The war would have happened regardless what you do, because this is this is the next Hitler. It's inside him. Uh, it, it, it comes out at some at some stage. You can sort of put it back for a while, but it is this time. 
to uh, to to break out. Um, in all these uh, di discourses, uh, the, the, this uh, and and then of course Weber, Max Weber and, and mentions the sociology. Max Weber says the limit of verstehen of interpreting uh, is madness. Yeah, the, the, only the mad cannot be understood. Of, of course, Sigmund Freud would have, would have said that that is that, but even that is is clear. But the moment you say that that there can be no interpretation, no understanding, you declare the other side to be a barbarian, a devil, or a man. Yeah, that that technology is is well known, uh, go, going back to the especially the first the first world war. I I want to I, I want to say something on your first question though. Um, if you if you follow the uh, the Israeli press, which I can do only through through Haaretz, be, because I can't can't read Hebrew, um, there is an undergoing underlying debate in the uh, uh, in 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 the, in, the, in Israel between the military, the secret services, and the government on the following question. Um, the, the, or on the background, which was that up to the beginning of this war, we believed that uh, Gaza was the best, the best surveillance uh, uh, place in the world. You could not say something to your children without some Israeli device, sort of uh, hearing what, what, what you're saying. How could they build a military of 25,000 people Dug, dig all these tunnels, uh, uh, build these, and 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 Netanyahu at some stage, uh, confronted with this question, uh, claimed that his secret services had failed to tell him about it. That that they had misunderstood the signals, or something, which I think is cannot be possible uh, for a very long time. Remember a number of years ago. This elite unit of the of the Israeli army, which which was charged with uh, uh, electronic surveillance of of uh, of the Gaza population, yeah, there were about 200, 300 uh, young specialists who who were serving on that unit, who declared in a public in a, in, a, in an open letter that they were resigning from the from the uh, from this force because they could no longer bear. The idea that that they were sort of listening to everything that these people were were were, were talking to each other. Yeah, well, how was it possible that this could happen? And and I I think that there is this hypothesis in the in the in the Israeli debate, which is that uh, for uh, Netanyahu, uh, Netanyahu was basically confident that Hamas and uh, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, Fatah were no longer able to uh, to to and, and and in this sort of technological arrogance, he thought that once they come out, we can defeat them. But if we go in before they come out, uh, there would all be, we would have casualties. There would be all these things, and you would have to defend it and 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 so on. In, in this confidence that with this technical superiority, any uh, uh, uprising uh, could be uh, beaten down. So that that's my hypothesis that I see behind the the, the debate about the capability of the Netanyahu uh, government. Yeah. <clears throat> Next question. Thanks so much for that. Um, next, we have uh, a question in chat. Um, David writes. We don't talk about uh, how corporate capitalism is a significant reason for going to war. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So I'm uh, I'm not really sure if David is just generally speaking about particular sectors and their interests yeah. um, in per, in in those kinds of pursuits. Yeah, this is this is interesting. But but my my claim is that uh, wars are a thing uh, of their own. And and they have a logic of their own. Uh, of course, in a capitalist society, there are all sorts of of relationships 
be, between military strategy and uh, the, the profit machine of, of, of capitalism. And, and this relationship is so sort of historically fluid. It can change from period to period. In my, in my view today is that now we are in a world of uh, uh, rising, uh, of, 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 of the rise of uh, microtechnology and artificial intelligence. And, and uh, industry itself uh, does not have the, 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 the means to, to fund this enormous trans uh, transformation. But if you can persuade the, uh, your, your, your government that they absolutely need to have the most advanced information technology uh, uh, weapons and arms, and, and that they have to fund research on how to do that, and, and to, to invent these wonderful drones that, that can identify the enemy and then shoot him off without uh, any, any human being intervening. Then you can think of the preparations for war and the battlefield itself as an as a sort of industrial policy testing ground for the further development of these things that came out of Silicon Valley already sort of already uh, uh, supported by uh, the, the most advanced wing of the uh, of, of American capital and uh, that uh, today uh, the uh, uh, arms policy of the United States could be a new industrial policy for the rejuvenation uh, of American industry and there you would have a relationship not in a causal sense uh, nobody goes to Netanyahu and says that why, why why don't you allow for for a little war going going on because we need to test our 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 new equipment. But these coincidences and and these uh, uh, situative uh, overlaps are, are interesting. If I wanted to write the story history of it, he asks as you mentioned at the start, a lot of your writing has focused on political economy, the crisis of democratic capitalism, and the concept of national sovereignty in this context. Do you think the thesis you presented today on the dynamics of geopolitical conflict can be integrated into that framework going forward? It, it has to be. Has to be. Uh, it, it has to be. The, the, the thing I'm... <laughs> I have, uh, a year ago, I have agreed to write the concluding essay of a, of a book wonderfully uh, sort of put together by, by, by friends of mine, Marino Regini, on, on comparative, comparative uh, political economy and what the state of comparative political economy is. In that article, it is absolutely clear that now with this experience, you have to take uh, the military, uh, uh, the uh, international system, the system of peace and war, you have to take them very seriously in, in order to understand what, be, what became out of uh, our discipline compared to political economy in the 1980s and 1970s when we were beginning to push this. We never at no point uh, had a very good idea about uh, uh, where, where uh, military, the war, uh, uh, empire building, uh, where that would, would, would fit in. There, there were the communists somewhere on the other side of the border, but the communists were only, let's say, one quarter of the world economy. At some stage, they would either disappear or they would become like us. But that was not a central theme. Permit writes, returning to your talk's title, can you sum up who the irresponsible bystanders are and discuss how they can meaningfully assume responsibility and perhaps also be held responsible to bring about different outcomes yeah. than originating yeah. war. Yeah, yeah. It, it has to be seen that uh, that these events are not just uh, uh, events that are uh, uh, brought that that, that that are started uh, by the immediate participants. Uh, the, the, if there is war in a world where you have the United Nations, yeah. um, all countries are uh, yeah. responsible in the sense that they have failed to prevent that war uh, from, uh, from beginning. The, 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 they, they didn't intervene. The Germans sold these, these uh, uh, submarines to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Israel, uh, which are, uh, uh, you can be pretty sure, 90% uh, 
uh, that they will be able to fire a nuclear a nuclear warhead. Yeah, to a country that uh, uh, denies having uh, uh, nuclear bombs, but also uh, and doesn't de de neither say they have it or the, nor, nor do they say they have not. They they don't have. It. Uh, that is one thing, and and the other thing is to at least in, on on the side of the West, look at the European countries. They they were looking at the United States. And and they were sort of very careful to get into the head of, let's say, George Bush II, as he was beginning to pile up this unbelievable arsenal uh, of uh, of military uh, equipment, and and starting this uh, this uh, uh, war on, uh, you know, the, to give an example, the the present. Uh, the present uh, president of, of the Federal Republic, uh, a man named Steinmeier, uh, who was the chief of staff under, under Schröder. Uh, after Schröder had, de had refused to join uh, the, uh, uh, the, the coalition of the willing and, and march into Iraq, together with the French, the, the, both Chirac and Schröder uh, did do. then. In order to in order to appease the Americans, he had to allow uh, the the big American military base Armstrong uh, to to collect all these poor people that they sort of uh, uh, arrested all over the world uh, for, as candidates for uh, the the president on uh, on on Cuba. Yeah, they all went through. Uh, Guantanamo. They all went through Germany, and and while Schröder had been and had had the uh, to not send German troops to Iran, uh, then Germany became uh, the, uh, uh, the the place, the base for this uh, war on terror operation. You have to imagine there were hundreds of flights uh, coming from all over the world. These people were interrogated, so, and then they were sent to work down home. Yeah. They, they, this is where, where sovereignty comes in, incidentally. Uh, what you can, what you have to, what you have to demand is that these countries uh, remember that they are sovereign states and they and they can have their own will. Now at the beginning, I said something on these huge size differences, but it is something that has to be collectively faced because otherwise, these uh, uh, American operations that that fail or don't fail or leave leave a total desert like in like like, like in Iraq or, or or in Libya, then they will continue because of, of for the Americans it is not. It is not very substantial, on, only for the people on the ground. Next, we have a question from Esty. Esty, I'm going to ask you to turn on your camera, and I'm going to ask you to unmute to ask your question. Hello, thank you. Um, you asked, um, well, you questioned um, the the notion that the Israeli um, intelligence didn't know about what was happening and and that Netanyahu didn't know what was happening. But uh, according to the Times of Israel and a number of other sources, uh, Egypt's intelligence minister, General Abbas Kamel, personally called Netanyahu 10 days before the attack yeah. and uh, let him know that Gazans were likely to do something unusual, a terrible operation, and yet he paid no yeah. Attention. So, um, so that that raises questions, and uh, one um, one way to explain it that um, some Israelis raise is that um, he wanted something like that to happen because um, he is an extremely unpopular prime minister, and uh, he's looking at trials for um, yep. Yeah, and and uh, if there's war, people support him. And you know, I, and as Israeli American myself, I can tell you that um, what's happening in Israel now is absolutely 
um, strange. I have not seen that happening before. People who absolutely hate Netanyahu, who absolutely hate his government, are supporting this. It's not really a war. It's an attack on um, a huge number of civilians who have no real army, who don't even have yeah. um, home shelters. So, um, and that also is a possible explanation to why he hasn't done anything about the abductees for eight weeks and and and, and why he says that um, the war will continue because that's his only way to remain the president and not possibly end in prison. And one more thing is um, since the war started, Israel has already awarded a dozen oil and gas exploration licenses in Gaza to six different big oil companies, including BP, and that's according to Al Monitor and um, other sources again. And you didn't talk about the role of natural resources and um, the way the United States and Europe seem to feel like um, they deserve the world's natural resources so um if you you know if you want to if you want to um discuss that i would appreciate it yeah but doesn't uh, know much about what's happening in the uh, command centers of a of a nation at war uh, they they conduct their business in in, in secrecy and before you draw conclusions, you want to be always very uh, sort of careful. In, I have spent a good deal of my life watching politicians more or less close up. And uh, one sort of rule of thumb is that if they do something, they usually have several reasons at the same time. One, one reason is not enough. Yeah? You know, if you want to lead a country, then you have to get a feeling, a sense of the different uh, sort of motivations that could carry uh, a particular strategy, even if they are co in contradiction with, with each other. And your charismatic capacity is to convince uh, people with very different backgrounds that what you're doing is the right thing. Maybe some of them think it's in order to, to have peace. Others think it's in order to, to wipe out the opposition. I still others think I don't care about peace and opposition. I want to make a buck, yeah. But but then you have to bundle these 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 different things. That's what polit what modern politics is is about. And someone like Netanyahu seems to be pretty good at this. It doesn't work all the time, and and it may not work forever. Maybe in 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 this case, I can't imagine that that he would have said. Uh, uh, let, let that happen in, in order to have a real war. But uh, that people calculate like, uh, well, in a, uh, the worst case would be they come out and start a war, but then we have the means to push them back. Yeah, the, the sort of uh, Greenspan theory of, of, of counterinsurgency. Uh, there is yet another question from a different David. We've had three Davids so far, thank goodness. Thank you, Davids. Please come again. Um, David writes, the absence of contextualization is disastrous for both policy and analysis, but the opposite leads to, and I'm going to read it in English because I never took French and I apologize to everyone, to understand everything is to forgive everything. What's the role and limit on values and something that goes back to E.H. Carr. Yeah, no, I'm, I have an answer for this, which is, which is there is a supreme value, which is not to send young men into a battlefield where they die and kill others. Wars are about killing and, and dying. Uh, killing is maybe even, is, 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 is not, not much better than, than dying for, for, for those that participate. Think about these these drug addicts in the United States, who former former servicemen, uh, who who, uh, who who don't find a way back into into their lives, so the absolute, in my view, the absolutely the first uh, uh, first value is stop the killing, uh, and then you can think about 
how can we live with each other without resuming uh, killing uh, each other? The, the, what, what was the, uh, yeah, and, and to understand everything means to forgive everything. No, of course not. See, I'm, I'm a sociologist. I'm, I'm, I'm trained in this, in the art of interpreting something. If, if I, if I interpret, uh, uh, if I try to understand uh, why X or Y did something, then I also have to, have to consider that they also have agency. They all can. They, there's no, there's no one to one force. Either. If, if you sit in a corner and, and you can't get out of that corner then, of course, you may be forgiven to do something because you have no choice. But people usually do have choice. Yeah. And, and, and public reasoning, even, uh, even uh, an uprising in the street. If, if the Germans in, in the 1930s and, and a little later had not been so cowardly, uh, and, and if they had uh, sort of appeared in the streets, and like some of them tried to, the, the workers' movement wasn't completely, had completely disappeared. Then maybe the government would either have fallen or some wing of the government, uh, less bloody, would, would have taken. We, we simply do not know. But, uh, but, but what we do know is that no war is better than war, almost in all circumstances. I want to take a different tack here and ask about solutions. Uh, in a recent testimony to the UN, our mutual acquaintance, colleague, semi-friend Jeff Sachs observed that there are four ongoing wars right now. There's the one in Ukraine, yes. he dates from 2014 and the violent overthrow of uh, Yanukovych, not, not from 20. 21, which is how it's usually dated in the U.S., yep. Israel, uh, with the Palestinians, which has been going on at least since 1960, Syria is relatively recent, recent, you know, different tendencies just spreading. But the important message Sachs offered was each of those could be stopped more or less immediately if the U.N. Uh, got its uh, shit together, yep. in that each of them relies on a bunch of aid from people outside the immediate belligerents, and each of them is rooted in some sort of economic slash social grievance, which could be. And so you could just say, look, we're not going to supply you anymore, and you've got to get into discussion, and then let's talk about the underlying grievance. Uh, what is your view of A, that, and B, how a thinking left in the U.S. and Germany and elsewhere around the world could get us toward that sort of solution. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, I mean, I remember that Jeffrey said that uh, in, in in front of religious leaders, uh, and of course, this is the place to to be hopeful. Uh, and uh, it's a very it's a very nice, very impressive speech. Uh, in all of these stories, the United States figure. Uh, figure uh, uh, centrally, and and uh, it is the responsibility of this invincible, huge country, this giant among the countries, uh, whose whose special status we have to recognize if we want to uh, think about uh, a solution to these crises. Uh, most people talk about the states or the, the international community. No, no, it is the United States. How, what is the chance that the United States can uh, sort of, for example, change their policy with respect to Israel? I think it is not completely to be precluded. Right. I, Much less my, than... I, I'm sorry, I shouldn't interrupt. Uh, Joel, my... My uh, uh, feeling is that the fact that uh, um, Israel commands what they, in, in, in the internal discussion, calls the Samson option. You know, Samson was this giant in, the, in, in, in Israeli history who, who uh, 
in the battle against one of those peoples that that the old Israelis sort of wiped out, uh, and with all of them in one big big church or temple, this guy Samson came in and uh, pulled these uh, the, the columns uh, uh, down that carried the roof, and then he was dead, but all the others also. Yeah, the Samson option, uh, which is which is the nuclear. The, the nuclear device. I don't think the Americans can be interested in uh, the, the Israelis sort of using their Samsung option. I, I think that would be <laughs> that would be the end. So so what they have to do is to try to uh, to to mediate some sort of uh, uh, outcome of this war that is acceptable to Iran. Uh, uh, the other Arab nations, the Arab nations, Iran, the Muslim nations around that country, so that you can embed it into some sort of peace, a peaceful relationship. Now, how, how can that be possible? And then comes the question, uh, did, are you serious about this? Or can you be serious? Um, in my view, uh, without uh, cleaning the, uh, the, the, the West Bank, uh, and 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 uh, taking out these settlers, there's no way you can negotiate any uh, peaceful relationship with the Palestinians. It's it's simply impossible. And and the way I understand it, the way the West Bank has been settled was exactly for the purpose of the irreversibility of this of these settlements. Yeah. Uh, so what you 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 send someone who pulls out seven hundred thousand people armed to the teeth? Where do they go? Where do you where do you send? Them? Yeah. Um, this is where the sense of futility come, 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 comes in. You you can create facts that are not uh, available for for change anymore. But you would have to change exactly that in order to achieve a solution. Now then, now then, you you can begin to fantasize, and uh, sometimes, sometimes I think it would not be such a bad idea if the world was again bipolar rather than monopolar, where on the other side would be China, and 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 no longer the Soviet Union, and maybe. The combined uh, power of China and the United States, uh, and then Russia and and uh, France and, and the UK, they all would go along if these two, if these two, then maybe they can move something that we cannot imagine is moving. So, uh, can you imagine the American Senate to me to an American Chinese? Uh, uh, bipolar directorate in the, in the Middle East. I don't know. Uh, no, no, I cannot imagine that now. I, I, what I'm trying to do is great, get greater clarity in concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agenda for an American left, uh, and uh, you know, I, I think it does centrally involve not just interventions in one or another little war that we're engaged in without great personal costs in blood, not not treasure. I mean, Iraq was four or five trillion dollars. So, uh, uh, but we have to have a view on how we want uh, international geopolitics to be organized, if not yeah. through. Um, uh, maintenance of U.S. hegemony and protection of all of America's alleged security threats. So it's basically a plea for the left to get us act together on geopolitics. Was yeah, 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 absolutely. And and I would even say that uh, multipolarity would be better than bipolarity, if if it was possible to bring in a few other big countries uh, uh, also into this sort of sort of global directorate uh, with, with a reform of the security council so that these countries could also play a play a role there don't expect that europe as a as as a european union could could be an, an actor there 
uh, Europe is too is too diverse, and and uh, you cannot imagine it as a consolidated actor. But Brazil, yes, uh, and and if if there was a sort of multipolar uh, power structure in the world, and the United States were willing to learn that they can have their little Monroe place in in in, in central in Central America, but otherwise stay out of of, of the rest of the world, and. And reduce their 750, uh, uh, 750 foreign bases to to maybe twenty five. Uh, it, that could be a beginning, yeah. <laughs> but it would have to start in your country, Joe. No yeah, other. no, I I agreed entirely. So, Adrian, I think we're running out of time. Uh, we are at time, uh, and thankfully, we've ended on what I hope was a hopeful note, at least um, an exploration of the possibilities moving forward um, that we are not stuck. So I, on behalf of the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice, I'd really like to thank Wolfgang Streich for joining us today um, for his remarks to you all, our audience, as well as to our partners at Verso Books and Contra Magazine. We hope to see you again in the spring. Until then, take care.